Hi and welcome to Themico. In this video, we will talk about the kinematic analysis of a planar mechanism. We will see what specific characteristics of a mechanism allow us to apply the kinematic analysis and which ones are not taken into account. This will be a more mathematically oriented lesson that might require you to take it slowly and go over the content a few times. Let's dive in. In our course, we talk about two different types of analysis in simulations. We spoke about the kinematic and dynamic analysis. You can say that a kinematic analysis is the type of analysis that ignores forces and torques applied to our mechanism. It is important to bring some knowledge from one of our previous lessons where we talked about dynamically and kinematically driven mechanisms. You saw that in kinematically driven mechanisms, the total number of degrees of freedom was zero. Because besides the geometric constraints, we had imposed a motion constraint. Okay, but why are we giving so much emphasis to the constraints? This is because the starting point of the whole kinematic analysis formulation is based on the system's constraints. Let's say we have a system, any kinematically driven system, and we already know the full set of constraints, geometric and time dependent. Then we collect these constraints in a vector of constraints like CQT equals C1 QT, C2 QT, and so on until CNC QT transpose equals zero. In the vector of constraints, you see that we have NC constraints. This simply means that we could have any number of constraints and it is not restricted to a specific number. We also see from these equations that our constraints might depend on the generalized coordinates Q and time. Even more, we also see that this vector represents a collection of algebraic equations, most likely nonlinear. The first step in the kinematic analysis is to find out the values of the generalized coordinates that fulfill this set of constraints. This is called position analysis. The first thing to do in this formulation is to solve the set of constraint equations for the current system's configuration. Because of the motion or motions imposed, it is expected that the mechanism will move by a small change in the values of the generalized coordinates as time passes by. Then. To determine what would be the resultant position or configuration of the mechanism after this small generalized coordinate change, we will need to add this change to our original system's configuration. As you suspect, this becomes an iterative procedure of calculating the generalized coordinate values, then letting the mechanism move, then calculating again the value of the generalized coordinates, and so on. For this iterative method, we need a tool to solve this system of nonlinear algebraic equations. In our case, we will be using Newton Raphson algorithm to find the value of the generalized coordinates that satisfy the set of equations. We will refer to the result of the algorithm as the solution vector. The Newton Raphson method assumes that you have an initial estimate, a guess of what the solution vector should be. We will give the name QI to this estimate. However, the real solution will be the initial estimate plus a small difference between the initial estimate and the real solution, which we will call delta qi. This means that the solution to the set of algebraic equations representing the constraints can be written as qi plus delta qi, where delta qi is given the name of vector of Newton differences. Using Taylor's theorem, the vector of constraints can be written as C Q I plus delta Q I T equals C Q I T plus del C Q I T by del Q I times delta Q I plus half del square C Q I T by del Q I squared times delta Q I squared and so on. Some of the terms of this Taylor's polynomial are known to us, like the Jacobian matrix of the constraints C Q I. Let's change them to this known format. CQI plus delta QIT equals CQIT plus CQI times delta QI plus half CQI times delta QI QI times delta QI squared and so on. As we said, if the vector QI plus delta QI is a solution of the system of algebraic nonlinear equations, then we can say that CQI plus delta QIT equals zero. And if we consider that the higher order terms in the Taylor expansion series are very small, we can rewrite our equation as CQIT plus CQI delta QI is approximately equal to zero. 
or CQI times delta QI equals minus CQIT. Considering our Jacobian matrix to be invertible, and because we are talking about a kinematically driven mechanism, we can invert the Jacobian matrix to obtain the vector of Newton's differences. Delta QI equals minus CQI inverse times CQIT. You might think, well, now I have all the necessary components to know the solution of my set of constraints. Yes and no. Possibly no. In the best of the cases, at this point, you might be one step closer to the final solution. You see, once you've applied this step, you could evaluate the solution vector in the set of constraint equations. And you'll notice that the solution is not exact. You'll need to repeat this process over and over again until the value of the vector of Newton's differences becomes very small and until the solution evaluated gets very close to its real value, which in our case is zero. All of what we have done until now is to find the acceptable values of the generalized coordinates which describe the configuration of our system. In the next lesson, we will talk about the velocity and acceleration analysis. Thanks for watching and have a nice day.